Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief for the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, Robin Hood Radio's very own critic, about whom we're possessive. He joins us weekly, and... This is the 10 best of 2020. Hi, David. How are you? Doing okay, Jill. How are you doing so far in this new year? It is fresh and it is young. Yes, it is. Well, we'll see what we can do to it. (laughs) (laughs) Have fun. All right. I'm very glad that we are in this uh, in this new year. And uh, as always, at this time of year, I like to look back at the year just passed. Uh, I do it a little bit later than some people do, but I like to make sure I've caught up with everything worth catching up with. And uh, I am ready to unveil uh, my, my 10 best for the year of, of 2020. So let's begin with number 10 and do a countdown that way. My number 10, 10 best film, 10th, 10th best film of the year is The Nest. Uh, by Sean Durkin, written and directed by Sean Sean Durkin, a very very uh, interesting and talented uh, director who who a few years ago made a movie called Martha Marcy May Marlene, uh, funny title I know, but uh, which was a very very good um, oh kind of semi horror movie uh, with a whole lot to say about cults and that sort of thing. And The Nest uh, is his uh, another very very good film by Sean Durkin. It's about it's about a couple. Uh, they're sort of going on middle age, I guess they have a couple of youngish children and, uh, they are sort of between, uh, England where he is from and the United States where she is from. And, uh, he thinks of himself as a real hot shot in business and he's going to really set the world on fire and make a jillion dollars for everybody and for himself. And they're going to have a lovely life. The trouble is he is spending the money. He is counting his chickens. He is counting his eggs before they're actually in the basket before they're actually hatched and uh, all kinds of very very bad things come from this the marriage begins to come under terrible strain and the movie is a a, a sort of a, a satire really kind of of executive greed and corporate malfeasance and also a disintegrating marriage but it's really really well acted by Jude Law and Carrie Coon along with a very very fine supporting cast I was very impressed by The Nest I think it's a great uh, critique of what goes on sometimes when we don't have a firm grasp on how to handle money. And uh, anyway, I found it a very dramatic and interesting movie. Second film, number nine on the list of the 10 best, is I'm Thinking of Ending Things, uh, which is, I think, a, a really, really fascinating movie by the wonderful Charlie Kaufman, who is a very eccentric screenwriter who occasionally directs a movie as well. And this is one of the ones that he both wrote and directed. Uh, and it is the story, it, it, is, it is based on a very interesting novel, and it is basically a horror movie, uh, but not a, very, not a particularly violent or harrowing one. It's more one of where the atmosphere kind of gets to you. Uh, and it's about, oh, it's hard to even say what it's about, but it's about a young couple who are going off to visit his parents where the young woman will meet his parents for the first time. And once they get there and once things start happening, all kinds of unexpected developments occur, uh, which they end up in a very strange school building in the middle of nowhere. And there's a janitor involved. And it's just a really, really interesting movie. Now, Charlie Kaufman makes strange and unusual movies in which characters sometimes sort of seem to be shifting identities and time sometimes doesn't seem to be flowing in one single direction and that very much happens with I'm Thinking of Ending Things Uh, but I just found it a very absorbing movie interestingly it's more restrained than the novel that it's based on uh, but I found it just kind of got under my skin and it did what Charlie Kaufman does best which is to really innovate in terms of form and content while at the same time uh, giving us a, a very straight ahead and absorbing story in a lot of ways. Uh, He's the one who gave us the screenplay for, for, among other movies, Adaptation. Uh, And um, uh, he's just a really, really interesting figure. And I hope his career continues to flourish. And I'm thinking of ending things as one of the most interesting movies of the past year. Next movie is a documentary. Now, uh, some of my colleagues have been saying, hey, it's been a great year for documentaries. You know, 
every year is a great year for documentaries. There's always a lot of worthwhile stuff out there. And nowadays with the internet and cable and you know pay TV and all of that, there's more documentaries than ever. And that always includes a whole lot of worthwhile ones. Crazy Not Insane is by Alex Gibney, one of the most uh, gifted and prolific of the political documentary makers out there. Uh, and this is a movie which basically deals with serial killers. And it focuses on a scientist who has made a study of serial killers over the years, and she has concluded that there is pretty much always some sort of real brain damage involved in people uh, who we are often written off by society as simply being evil in some supernatural way. Oh, they're just evil. Uh, they should just be be put to death and we should just forget about them. And, and, and what she is suggesting is that uh, there's more to it than that, that this is all a kind of mental illness. And of course, you have to keep these people behind bars. But to simply say, oh, it is evil and we must simply regard them as some sort of garbage to be gotten rid of uh, is way too simplistic and doesn't really get at the heart of the problem. So I found Crazy Not Insane to be the most fascinating of all the documentaries that came out. And again, what was, once again, a very good year for documentaries. I really recommend it. It's about real things in our society, and it raises a whole lot of fascinating psychological issues where they overlap with legal issues and Really interesting movie, Crazy, Crazy Not Insane. Next movie on the list, number six, is Shirley by Josephine Decker. And this is a movie about the great writer Shirley Jackson and about her eccentricity and her strange sort of family life and is all sort of told through the, the eyes of, of, of some people who come in and, and live with her and her husband for a while. And it has Elizabeth Moss in a really wonderful and risky and daring performance as the great writer in this sort of semi-biopic about Shirley Jackson. Now, I must say Elizabeth Moss is also in The Invisible Man, which is a very, very interesting horror movie from the past year and she's very good in that too but of the two performances the one that really took me by storm was Shirley a fascinating subject Shirley Jackson was a really marvelous and interesting writer and uh, Elizabeth Moss is a really fascinating and interesting actress and uh, I really think that uh, that she, she brings it off it's a really good movie again Josephine Decker not a very well known filmmaker but I hope that her career really flourishes because she has real talent Next movie, number five, uh, yeah, number five we're up to. Number six, excuse me, number six is by a filmmaker much better known, and that is the great Spike Lee. Spike Lee sort of comes and goes. That is to say he's always busy, and he's always making a whole lot of work. He's really prolific, and it's just incredibly talented. Uh, but sometimes he'll go for a few years without making a movie that's really excellent. Uh, but this year, I think he has come back with a movie which is really excellent, Da Five Bloods, which is about a bunch of older black men who returned to Vietnam where they fought in the war on a sort of a mission to sort of reclaim something there. And the movie gets to something which has really never been treated before in a direct way, and that is the African-American experience fighting the Vietnam War and the terrible extra challenges uh, that were faced by black men who were fighting in that war, and black women too, but in this case it's a bunch of black men. And the movie is large, expansive, epic. It has a lot of action in it. It has a lot of, of real human drama in it and it has just a lot of amazing performances so many that I won't even try to list them here again it's mostly about a bunch of older guys although there's also a younger guy who is very much very important to the story and they're dealing with some of the people they knew when they were in Vietnam and their dealings back here in America and anyway again it's an ambitious uh, really um, socially relevant and socially conscious and politically relevant and politically conscious movie that I really really recommend it is not not a perfect film, but it's a really, really powerful film, and again, a really ambitious film that deals with all kinds of topics that are rarely touched on by American movies or any movies, and I really welcome The Five Bloods by the great Spike Lee. Next movie is an Italian movie, Martin Eden by Pietro Marcello. Martin Eden is based on a novel by a very, very great American novelist, Jack London. And it is an unusual novel for Jack London, though, because it's not a novel of the sea. Uh, when I started reading it, I thought it would be, because the main character, the title character, uh, is a guy who has spent a good part of it. He's still pretty young, but he's spent you know, pretty much all of his life so far on the sea. But at the beginning of the story, he's back on land, and he's meeting a very wealthy, powerful family, and he falls in love with the young woman of this family. 
and he really works so, so hard to try to be like them. He is not educated. He is not privileged. He comes from a very different sort of background, but he, he sort of respects and even worships the privileged folks and the wealthy folks, and he wants to be more like them if he possibly can, and he strives in that direction. But then all kinds of unexpected things happen. Uh, it has a very downbeat conclusion. The novel does and the movie does, even though they're slightly different. Uh, so it is not a feel-good movie, but I found it a very powerful movie, beautifully acted and directed with tremendous visual flair by Florian Zeller, who brings in all kinds of unexpected elements. It's a period film. It takes place in the past, and a lot of those elements have to do with that. But I also found it just a really powerful human drama. Uh, Martin Eden, uh, I am delighted to see, has been very, though, very well received by the critical community, and I really, really hope that people go and see it. It is so worth seeing. Martin Eden, a wonderful Italian movie based on an American novel and beautifully acted and magnificently directed. Next movie, number four on the list of the ten best, is The Father, directed by Florian Zeller. Now here we have another movie which is not uh, a feel-good movie, but I found it, again, a really, really powerful drama. It stars the great Anthony Hopkins, and he plays a man who is an older man, in fact, he's pretty old, who is falling into Alzheimer's disease or some sort of dementia, and that is what it's about. And it is all seen through his eyes, his state of mind, his experiences uh, with his daughter who is looking after him, with others who come into his life, with people who it turns out don't even exist. They're figments of his own uh, rapidly declining, or I shouldn't say rapidly, but let's just say steadily declining mental faculties. Sometimes it's hard to tell what in the movie is real, what is not real, but it is not an avant-garde movie. It's a movie where you all always are basically clear about what exactly going on, what, what exactly is going on on and it is very much anchored by this amazing performance by Anthony Hopkins. He is by no means failing in his powers. He is still one of the greatest actors that we have and for people who still think of him maybe for oh one of his many iconic roles like say The Silence of the Lambs, the Hannibal Lecter pictures, this is the opposite end of the scale. It's gentle, it's quiet, it is very dialogue driven. In fact it's based on a play but it's just an amazing movie and I found it a movie that I really find it hard to dismiss from my mind. It is almost literally haunting. And that is largely because of Anthony Hopkins, but it's also just because the movie is wonderfully written and directed, always in a very quiet, gentle way. It's a movie which is really going to have its major exposure in this new year, 2021. It'll be much more widely seen soon than it has been so far, but I'm really glad that it's getting out there. It's really, really a remarkable film, and I really want to spread the word about it. The Father, starring the great Anthony Hopkins. Number three on the list is a movie that so many of my critics agree with me is such a wonderful, wonderful film, First Cow, directed by Kelly Reichardt, who I think has never made a bad film. In fact, I think she's never made a film which is not really, really, really good. And First Cow is just right up there near the top of her work. It's a Western. And the title, a very unglamorous title, First Cow, what could that be about, is about a community where, yes, there is so far only one cow has been brought in. And we have a couple of people who sort of want to go into business selling this, uh, this, this kind of food that they're good at making. But they need milk in order to make this food, and there's only one cow, and the cow does not belong to them. So they have to figure out some way to get milk out of this cow without anybody finding out that they're kind of turning into milk thieves. And that's what the movie is about. And that may not sound like the most exciting subject ever invented, but it's a really, really marvelous movie. It's funny, it's gentle, it's poignant, it's wonderfully, wonderfully acted, and it's made in the style which Kelly Reichardt has perfected, where everything is understated, underplayed, but gets to you all the more because of that. So First Cow, we've had another really big Western, which has just come out much more recently now, uh, News of the World, the very, very good Tom Hanks movie. But to my mind, it's nowhere near as good as First Cow. Kelly Reichardt, one of the most gifted fi filmmakers we have of, of any gender, uh, and I'm just so glad that she is really just 
flourishing in her career. First Cow is a wonderful movie. Our number two movie on the list, another movie by a female director, Eliza Hittman. And this movie is with another unusual title, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always. And it's about a young woman who needs an abortion and goes about getting an abortion. And I'll just let it go at that. It is just a story about the human dilemmas, the psychological dilemmas, the tremendous socio-political dilemmas that come up surrounding abortion in our society. And it's a very, very profoundly moving film about something which is very, very urgent. And I just hope, really wish that everybody would see it and think about it, whatever your politics are in this area. And the best movie of the year by the great British filmmaker Ken Loach, Sorry We Missed You, which is about a man who goes out to support his family by getting a job in the gig economy and finds that things are nowhere near as smooth and easy and uh, uh, upward looking as he had been led to believe. It's a movie about the economy of today. It's a movie about the family problems of today. It's a, a movie about the economic problems of today. And I'll use a phrase I've used before today, which is that it is a deeply moving human drama about a family in trouble. And I just found it unmelodramatic and gentle and understated, but hugely compelling and about very, very real social issues. So sorry we missed you. The best movie of 2020, 20, of 2020 uh, even though there were a lot of good movies in this wonderful year. And I hope everybody will catch up with these movies because they're all really worth seeing and they're all really positive in the messages that they have to offer us. So those are my 10 best movies of 2020, Jill. Thank you very much, David Sterrett. Films in Focus, the 10 best of 2020.